Hello, comrades. My name is Ashkan. I'm Madeline Dutlich. Um, since you're leaving, would you like to say some words first about the rank and file strategy kind of briefly? Yes. So apologize or apologies for disappointing, but um, I decided to kind of uh, pass off this responsibility to Ashkan because a comrade just hit me up and asked to get a beer to talk about a hard organizing day. And that's something that is like gonna be like a real thing that we can all do these days. And, you know, looking forward to the near future when things like Red Square are in person. So uh, it wouldn't have been as easy to bail on it. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, um, yeah, so last night on the, uh, the, general body meeting, I got an opportunity to kind of walk through my evolving thoughts over the years um, as or on like what to do for a paycheck, that kind of thing. Since, you know, I don't live off of a trust fund, I've always had to figure out how to, uh, you know, earn an income. And because of just be before I was a socialist, I've always been motivated by the kind of like idea that I should use my time to do something positive in the world. I don't exactly know where that idea came from and why I didn't want to just like, you know, get super rich like my classmates in chemical engineering. But um, eventually I did discover socialism and realized, you know, that it's that, yeah, the, the idea of actually how to make a difference in the world is maybe a bit more complicated than I thought of when I was more just, you know, like a Girl Scout or like a more like liberal reform mindset. Uh, and yeah, thankfully I've come across comrades in DSA who have made these really interesting uh, moves into what we call strategic industries, which one kind of main criteria for making it strategic is that it can't really be offshored. And yeah, so we need, you know, teachers to teach here in the United States. And it turns out they can be pretty powerful when uh, they are organized and fighting in the same direction. So I'm gonna, yeah, make the, make the leap. Uh, and and yeah, get into teaching and and we're specifically moving to New York City, uh, partially because um, it is one of the largest union locals of uh, teachers in the United States. And it's from what I hear, it's very uh, interesting to go into a job where uh, the there's wall to wall unionization very unimaginable here in Texas. I've worked for the state. I've worked in like local jobs. Um, and unfortunately, we still have a long way to go in Texas before work sites are uh, where you're not like the only person who's thinking about unions on the work site. And not to say that, you know, there, we all need to be organizing everywhere where we are, um, but there's certain like places where you can kind of plug into and the baseline understanding of class consciousness and like worker, the need for worker power and workers to exercise their rights is already kind of established. And then, so there's really cool opportunities for socialists to really start, of, start to um, push that even further and demand more democracy in the union, demand that the union fights for the class and not just the union members. And um, yeah, so really excited. I hope um, hope we all get to taste uh, what it's like to be in a wall-to-wall -wall, uh, unionized workplace <laughs> one day. Uh, yeah, anything you, yeah, Ash County. Okay, no, awesome. Um, so what, so in the last like five years or maybe a little more than that, the American left has undergone a major breakthrough or series of breakthroughs. Um, does anyone know what I mean by that? Like Phoebe, what's the difference between like the American left 
today versus like five years ago? Just you can, there are no wrong answers. Just spit out some ideas. Oh, sorry. I'm really bad on the spot. I. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, We're practicing being teachers. Yeah, exactly. You're Got a cold, cold call. call. All right. I'll try one more person, then I'll give it a shot myself. John, what's different today about the American left than like five or 10 years ago? What does it do? Uh, I would say Bernie. Mm -hmm. is one. Ding. Okay. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Um, you would have gotten it too, anyone else. Um, so yeah, like we've recognized, like for a long time, there was this like uh, anarchism that was quite dominant among the American left that like totally rejected everything. Everything sucks, which everything, you know, not ev almost everything sucks, right? Uh, reject government, reject politicians. Okay. Um, uh, there was like an anti-electoralism. And then like Bernie kind of demonstrated that actually maybe it's good to be um, anta still antagonistic toward, but maybe a little bit inside the state, right? And so the state is one of the major terrains of uh, the socialists are concerned with, the major terrains of class struggle, right? Um, and so it's just been transformative for the left to realize that because it turns out that actually you can start to build something of a mass base. Um, and I'm being unfair, obviously there are people who theorized about the state and worked on either elections or things like that. Um, but it wasn't like the unified perspective of like, for example, uh, the American socialist, I can't even say movement, but whatever grouping or groupings or whatever. Um, but now like a lot of us get it, right? A lot of us get that like, okay, you can like, it's not that like you can just pass like positive reforms and legislation all the way until like society is completely different. Like, no, of course not. But um, that's where politics is for a lot of people. And, they, and we can do things like building up the independent capacities of like working class people to like fight for ourselves through um, forms of legislation, right? So things that can be called like transitional demands, like Medicare for all makes it easier for the working class to organize. Um, which brings me to the second, uh, import, second equally important, um, maybe more important, yeah, sure. Uh, terrain of class struggle, which is uh, at the workplace, uh, which is the labor movement, right? Which is, um, which is workers organized at the point of production. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit tonight is uh, my journey on how to have like the most possible influence there because like all of you, I'm a socialist who wants to see like uh, the end of like capitalist exploitation. Um, and so if the American left realized that we need to have like an inside outside game when it comes to the state um, and our like position toward it, uh, we also recognize that like the labor movement is where our power is. Um, the working class, right? You've probably heard this, is the only group in society with both the like collective class-wide interest in abolishing capitalism because we're exploited <laughs> because we produce way more than we get. And, you know, there's the inequalities there's that arise bag from that. And small bag. Um, and also the ability, importantly, it's not just an interest. We have, we can actually do something about it as workers who are organized, who, who um, are, uh, you know, creating the value that's being taken from us. Um, and then, and then from there, I think it follows that like some workers are in more strategic positions in the economy than others. And this and this idea started to gain a lot of steam um, over in recent years too, since the like Bernie inspired explosion of the socialist movement. And so like Madeline was talking about, think jobs that for example, in America are difficult to outsource or jobs that um, have uh, lots of like organic like community connection so that you can bring in a uh, wider swath of the working class into your struggles. These are seen, or, or jobs that just like really like without them, um, the economy as we know it can't really run. And so that's why it's been identified. And I think like you can reason through this yourself and you can also look at kind of like recent history or, 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 or a little bit further too, um, that uh, education and healthcare and logistics like uh, UPS or the mail, et cetera. These things are critical for the economy. Um, and when workers in a given sector in a given industry or whatever, like, like all the teachers and teaching assistants and so on in LA withdraw their labor, um, they can make political demands uh, far beyond what you might be able to vote for on like a municipal ballot, right? 
because um, that's where power really is. It's so hard to get to people's, people to see that. Okay, so like my point is that socialists know that without an organized working class that is socialist, there's not gonna be socialism. In DSA, what we have is wonderful, right? We are working class people, pretty much for the most part, uh, gathered um, on like this political basis. And so we're giving this like, uh, like political expression to the entire working class and not just the uh, narrow interests of like um, of you, the service worker or you, the librarian, like, you, you know, there are some differences, obviously, in your lives. But what's shared is like that you guys are all workers um, and what we're doing in DSA. And it's kind of like fuzzy to see is but we're beginning to give a political expression to that class wide interest of not being exploited. That's our interest. We don't want to be exploited. And this is on the road. I say it's fuzzy to see because it's not just a political party, which would be kind of easier to understand. But that's what we're on the road to, I hope, you know? Um, okay. So back to the labor movement. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, if, if we know that socialism without the organized labor movement or socialism can't exist without the organized labor movement being socialist, um, then what, what can we do about it is the question. And so I've said that in DSA, we can fight for legislation, but we're kind of limited because we're not in DSA, we're not, we don't all work at the same place, right? We can't, if we all DSA members stop going to work, it's not gonna be like, it's not gonna bring down capital. It's just gonna, we're all just gonna like, you know, not get paid. Um, the errors of hashtag general strike. Yeah, which is why when people tweet general strike, that's incorrect. Um, but anyway, we, my point is that we can't influence the labor movement just from the outside. We can't just be DSA and be saying to like organized workers, oh, hey, come to us because we're correct or whatever. Um, maybe we can like try to build some links and that's definitely important. Um, but what the rank and file strategy is um, about is merging the entire labor movement with this like socialist consciousness. And so what we're talking about tonight is just what one of those, one of the most important tactics to that end, which is, drum roll that socialists, dedicated socialists like us, um, take a look at like what we're doing with our lives. And we think to ourselves, okay, well, um, if there are some parts of the economy that are super important um, and that it would be great if there were more people organizing there, um, uh, why don't I do that? And so it turns out that, you know, so this is, I mean, this is not a novel concept, um, some people on this call actually have been, have been aware of this and, and been practicing this for, for, for years or I wanna say decades. Um, but basically it's socialists getting, uh, the tactic is socialists getting jobs in strategic sectors. And even, even there are strategic unions. Some, some unions might be, uh, have more potential power than others. Um, and then from there, uh, what, what you run into is not you're, not, you're not going to just like go be a DSA member in your workplace. You're going to organize um, for that kind of uh, democracy that is so necessary in the labor movement. Um, and that, that just like in the rest of our society is also tends to be quite absent, right? Um, and so I can talk a lot more about that, but I think that's a good like introduction to the idea. Um, Subu, where should we go from here? I can talk more about Austin DSA and its limitations if that's helpful, whatever works for you. Uh, that's, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean like at our best, we organize really good uh, campaigns that try to like build the independent capacity of the working class to organize like I talked about. Um, and so, one of the best examples of those campaigns has been like the Medicare for all kind of movement that DSA has led. Um, and um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about like my work on that, which was that there was a paid sick days campaign in Austin in 2017. And this was a really good example of tying together local and national um, demands that would build working class power. So paid sick days, meaning mandatory or uh, mandating employees give time off to workers for being sick. Um, and then tying that to Medicare for all, which was the national um, demand for health insurance across the world, across the country. Um, 
And yeah, uh, I just think, so, so in that campaign, like we weren't organizing with like uh, rank and file workers. We were organizing with, in the paid sick days campaign. We were organizing with different like nonprofits and community groups. And we ended up theoretically winning that campaign at the um, city council level. But the shortcoming was that it was never actually enforced because the state of Texas kind of like shot it down. And I bring that campaign up because it's just like an example of like, when politics is totally like left at the realm of uh, the existing like government politicians and so on, the, the policies that actually get enacted are um, based on what kind of what they decide and the workers as political agents are left out. So like, for example, in order to actually win things like Medicare for all and paid sick days, um, and uh, it, it goes back to how like, political rights have been won for the working class throughout history, including, for example, like the right to like vote, which I think like a lot of people don't know about. Um, so I think like what that example in Austin DSA of like kind of, but not really winning paid sick time highlights is that without like organized workers who are exerting their muscles as workers, for example, like going on strike to make these like political demands for like health and safety issues, then, um, there's just like a limit to what we can win within DSA, even if what we're fighting for is just. And I just bring that up as like another motivation for why socialists um, should help like spread this consciousness in the labor movement.